Hello and welcome back to Silver Age Silver Screen, a podcast where we watch, discuss, and review sci-fi, cult, superhero, and other stereotypically geeky films. I'm your co-host, Casey Jarms. And I'm your other co-host, Riley Thorpe. Yeah, and I don't have anything to get us into this. You can see the episode name. We're doing Die Hard, the classic 1988 action movie starring Bruce Willis and Alan Rickman. It's it's a classic. It's a famous action movie. We have a lot of thoughts on it. Yeah, it was directed by John McTiernan, who arguably made the two best Die Hard movies, the first and the third. He also directed Predator, another classic action movie. He directed The Hunt for Red October, which is another incredible movie that I have not yet seen. This movie is become such an amazing cult classic for good reason. It's a good movie. And I, I'm, I, I'm going to be honest, I'm struggling to think of anything to say because it's hard to look back at classic movies that we all know and love and everybody loves Die Hard. Everybody says how great this movie is. It's like, what else can we say exactly? You know, I only watched this like a few years back for the first time. I I don't have like the classic, like this is a foundational movie for me, but still I can appreciate this is pretty good flick. Yeah, absolutely. I saw it for the first time just earlier this summer, actually. I watched it a second time today in preparation for this review. And yeah, it's an incredibly well-made film and we all knew that. So I don't really know much else other than to just get right into the review. Yeah. So the film starts out. We are introduced to a young Bruce Willis who has hair in this movie because it's a very young Bruce Willis (laughs) on an airplane going to Los Angeles uh, he has a gun with him because this movie was made before 9-11. Yeah. And that is such a weird thing to see. Especially for a cop. Well, I mean, a, I well, guess a, co- a cop even, even, would make even, more sense. Even, I meant even for a cop. Even yeah, for a I cop mean. At that time. Yeah, also, side note, why, why, why does he have a gun in this movie? I mean, I know he's a cop and it becomes useful later on but like okay i'm gonna go to my wife's christmas party better bring some heat (laughs) like and he brings it on the airplane like not even unloaded in the suitcase like it's in his pocket so the film opens up the plane's landing in the airport and a young john mcclain who's a tough but cool new york street cop he's clutching the arms of his seat because he's afraid of flying and i think right there An interesting thing that we often take for granted these days is how impactful this film was to action films from a character perspective. Because up to that point, like especially movies in the 80s, if you think of like classic action movies, you think like movies like from Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Wesley Snipes, Jean-Claude Van Damme, all those guys. Great movies. Well, I mean, Van Damme's movies are all terrible. Most of them are. But uh, when you think of those guys, you don't relate to them as people. They're just big guys roided out, jacked up, muscle men with big guns just walking into a crowd of people and just wasting them all. They're awesome, don't get me wrong, and they're classics, but you don't relate to them as people. This film very clearly establishes John McClane as one of the most compelling and relatable protagonists in an action film, especially for that time. He is afraid of flying. In the next scene, we see he is separated from his wife, and there's a bit of drama there. He hasn't seen her or his kids in like six months. He's having some trouble with his family, and he's just a regular guy that has some fears, anxieties, and problems in his personal life that we all experience. So I think that that must not go understated is how important it is that at this time, we'd never really seen an action hero that was that relatable. And here it is, front and center. Yeah, and it's 
John McClane, it isn't just, oh, he's more relatable because he's not Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's not a seven foot tall, buff, undestroyable killing machine. It isn't just that it makes him more relatable. It, as we'll get into as the film goes on, it makes him a much better protagonist and it a much more interesting action movie. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. John lands in LA. He's there to try and reconnect with his estranged wife at a Christmas party while he's on the plane a businessman next to him tells him hey you should take off your shoes because it's comfy and he's like okay i'll keep that in mind wonder if that's foreshadowing this film actually does have a very tight script like a lot of stuff yes. comes back later which is oh, always yeah, something absolutely. a light in the plane john takes a limo to his wife's place of employment the nakatomi plaza yeah this big under construction skyscraper in the middle of Los Angeles. Uh, John's driven there by this guy, Argyle, in the limo, who's a bit of comic relief, and he exposits about his backstory, and he's a tough New York City cop, didn't want to leave the city, but his wife had this job offer in LA, so now they're kind of split up, going to try and make things better. Uh, he goes up, he meets with his wife, they argue a bit about their failing marriage him not trusting her essentially yeah that was one thing obviously in that scene we're introduced to his wife holly's boss mr takagi and this douchebag that she works with named ellis who we're gonna get into in ellis's introduction has him snorting coke right as police officer john mclean walks in which Oh, Alice, you dumb motherfucker. Didn't he also hit on Holly and, like, try to hook up with her at one point before that? Yeah, this <laughs> this film has a lot of sleazy characters. There are, like, four people total in this film who aren't utter assholes. When McLean goes to Nakatomi Plaza, he finds out that his wife is not using his name. She's using her maiden name. And he goes up to the party that's the only people in that building are having this office-wide Christmas party. And he meets Ellis, Mr. Takagi, and they go into a private room and have a conversation and try to reconnect. But he starts an argument about her not using his name and then it becomes about how he didn't want her to succeed in her new job. And th they argue, as you said, Casey, and when I was watching the scene, it comes across to me like John McCain is a bit of an asshole. To her. I mean, like, yes, but let's not talk ill of the dead. <laughs> you said McCain instead of McLean. Oh, McLean, whatever. John, We're going to do uh, that a few John, times. I'm sure we are. But uh, yeah, John McLean, his wife tells him, I missed you. And he takes a pause, stares at her, and then starts yelling at her about how she's not using his last name. And it's like, okay, you could have said, I missed you too. I want to, you know, make our marriage work. But no, he just starts an argument and the two fight until she decides to leave and go off back to the party where he takes his shoes and socks off and makes fists with his toes, just like that businessman on the plane suggests. And it's a means of like, relaxing himself and calming yeah, just, and it surprisingly works. Just kick your shoes off. I mean, what is the worst thing that happened? You'll be forced to run away after a bunch of terrorists led by Alan Reichman burst into the party and you have to spend the whole movie barefoot? I mean, where are the odds of that? Who would have ever that? thought that would have happened? Who would yeah. have ever thought that would have happened? Anyway, then Alan Reichman shows up with a bunch of terrorists. Alan Rickman, he plays a German terrorist by the name Hans Gruber. And good God, does he kill it again. Yeah. Alan Rickman, rest in peace. God, he was a phenomenal actor. Hans Gruber is just such a arrogant, intelligent, smarmy villain. Like, and Alexander looked over his kingdom and he wept for there were no more lands to conquer, which is a misquote. Or there's a point where he says... I will give you till the count of three. There will not be a four. Like every line from Alan Rickman, as in the last Alan Rickman movie we talked about, is just great. He comes on screen and you feel the intelligence, the intimidation, the confidence this man has. And he kills it. 
this was the first movie to feature Alan Rickman, and it was one of the first things to feature Bruce Willis. They were both relatively unknown, and this movie just made both of them stars because they both give great performances. Yeah, so Hans Gruber and his goons, or his minions, fellow terrorists, they break into the plaza, take everybody hostage except John McClane, who's able to escape with his handgun, and now it's just one man up against a group of terrorists trying to break into the safe of Nakatomi Plaza in order to get $640 million in bearer bonds. Which in modern day money would be like $1.38 billion. I'm not looking at the Wikipedia page right now. So yeah, it's a big heist. That's a lot of money! It is. Part of the reason why this film works is Hans Gruber, it isn't just that he's a smart villain, it's that He actually is smart, like the thieves have a very carefully planned out, intelligent plan. Like the first thing we see, they pull up in the parking garage, they kill the guy at the front desk and replace him with one of their own members so he can like lead anyone away. Uh, Right after they take all the hostages, they cut the phone line so they can't call for help. And throughout the film, it isn't just that John McClane is outnumbered, it's that the people he's up against aren't idiots. They are tactical. Yeah, the conflict and the situations that McClane finds himself in are constantly evolving. Gruber takes Mr. Takagi upstairs to interrogate the computer access codes out of him that would give them access to the safe. But Takagi doesn't know, so Hans Gruber counts to three, and he doesn't give it, so Gruber shoots him dead in the face. And sets one of his fellow terrorists to try to break into the safe. Yeah, John McClane actually watches Takagi die, and if I remember correctly, some of the thieves like see him and are sent after him, but he sneaks away. He heads up to a floor that's under construction where he runs into one of the members of Hans Gruber's crew, a guy by the name of Tony. They get into a little scuffle. John McClane tackles him down a flight of stairs, breaking his neck, steals his machine gun, and then decides to inform the thieves of his presence by sending Tony's body down on an elevator with written on his chest, now I have a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. (laughs) Yeah, but before, the reason why the goon was able to find McLean and they got into the fight was because McLean set off the fire alarm. Oh, right. Which he attempted to bring the police to him, but eventually they were called off. That essentially did nothing but alert Gruber that someone was still in the building that wasn't accounted for, and he sends the goon up, and they fight. And that was another thing I noticed about that time, after they fight, McLean wins by, like, tossing him and the guy down a flight of stairs. And the action in this film is visceral and real and gritty and dirty. Like, when he fell down those flight of steps, I felt hurt. Honestly, I'm like, oh, God, that must be so painful. John McClane, like we were saying earlier, he isn't a big action hero. He takes damage during this film. He gets the shit beat out of him. There are several points where he just has to stop for 20 minutes of screen time because he's so beat up. Yeah, again, he's not just like a one-man tank that just walks into the group of terrorists and mows them all down. No, he's a guy who legitimately takes damage, and it hurts. After Gruber sees Tony in the elevator with the message on him from McLean, he realizes that whoever's doing this has skill. This isn't just a regular guy. It's not a security officer. This man has special skills and will mess all their plans up. McLean makes it to the roof where he uses the radio that he stole off of Tony to try to contact the police. Gruber and his goons pick up on the signal and send a bunch of the terrorists up to go kill McLean there. And during that interaction with the police McLean has, it's a pretty funny scene, I thought. Then that was the other thing, too. There's a lot of really good and compelling humor in this as well. Like, it's not just constant, intense dark and gritty there's a lot of good hilarious one-liners like when he's talking with the dispatcher and she's saying sir this is for emergency and he goes yeah no shit lady do you think i'm ordering a pizza here yeah that's the other thing about that scene what is wrong with la's dispatch lady 
like, help, I'm being murdered. Sir, you have to call 911. You can't just do it on the radio. Please, they're killing me. Gunshot, gunshot, gunshot. Oh, well, uh, send one cop there to check it out, whatever. And that's exactly what happens. While he's on the radio with the police, a bunch of the terrorists show up and they have a shootout in which McLean barely escapes by using the strap of the machine gun to grapple down to the vent system and just barely survive. Again, really intense, really gritty stuff. I had seen the movie and I was like, no, come on, come on, grab the other ledge, come on, no, 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 oh, thank God, he grabbed it. There was a lot of intense moments to it. From there, while McLean is still in the tower and Gruber's terrorists are onto his scent and trying to hunt him down, and the other terrorists are still trying to break into the safe, this cop by the name of Al, he's in the convenience store grabbing some Twinkies. He gets the call to check up on Nakatomi Plaza, goes there, McLean sees a cop coming in, Al enters the tower, checks around the lobby, realizes that there's nothing there. Yeah, because, like, Gruber replaced the security guard with one of his own men, a guy named Eddie, and he just sends Al Powell away. But don't worry, McLean throws the bodies of one of the terrorists he killed out onto the cop car. Yeah. That's a good way to get the attention of the police. Welcome to the party, pal. Yeah. Also, you didn't mention the cop in this movie, Al Powell, played by Reginald Vell Johnson, also played a cop on the show Family Matters, which I have not seen. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but... I have not. That just leads to so many questions like, do these movies take place in the same universe? Is the dad from Family Members, Al Powell, in witness protection after the events of this film? Probably not, but who knows? I think so. It could be, just like how Home Alone takes place in the exact same timeline as the Saw movies. I don't. That's a discussion for another day, but no, they do not. (laughs) It's just a fun theory. Yeah, so after throwing the body on the cop car, Al Powell drives to safety. He's also being shot at by the other terrorists. He's able to escape. He crashes his car rather spectacularly, and he's able to radio the other police officers as well as the media gets the attention of it. From then on, the police are surrounding the tower, and Al has a direct line of communication via the radio with John McClane, who goes under the alias Roy. Because up until this point, Hans Gruber does not know that his wife, Holly, is one of the hostages. Yeah. She's still going by her maiden name. And if you notice, at the beginning of the film, she turned over a photo of her family with him and laid it flat onto the counter. So Hans, being in that office, is standing right next to a photo that was tipped over. And all he has to do is lift it up and see that John McClane is potentially the one that's doing all this. And her cover will be exposed. After finally getting the attention of the police after a few failed attempts, like, it took throwing a body for them to notice because the firefighters were called off and now just left after Eddie told him nothing was wrong. But anyway, after he gets the attention of the FBI, McLean just chills out for a while because he's a smart character. He doesn't want to take on a bunch of terrorists by himself. But LAPD SWAT team tries to lay siege to the building and get gunned down with rocket launchers by the thieves on different floors. John is forced to step in and he drops a bunch of C4 down the elevator shaft and takes out a bunch of the terrorists. You know, we keep saying terrorists and the film does. Hans Gruber is not actually a terrorist. He is just a petty thief, albeit an exceptional petty thief who's only pretending to be a terrorist to manipulate the police. Mm -hmm. After multiple failed attempts of the police trying to get into Nakatomi Plaza, Ellis, the one and only, decides he's going to make a deal with Gruber to give him the man that they have been searching for. Although, uh, did did I miss something? Oh, yes. Um, Before that... McLean and Gruber do have a one-on-one conversation over the radio. McLean just torments him, and Gruber calls him a cowboy. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. Yep, one of the most iconic lines in cinema history, and John McLean's catchphrase throughout the rest of the series. 
So now he's had some more interactions with him, and over time, Gruber is starting to get a better and better idea of who McLean is. However, he doesn't know his name, doesn't know much about him, until Ellis, the sleazy corporate douchebag that Holly works with, decides he's going to negotiate with Gruber to save all their lives in exchange for John McLean. In that scene, not only does Ellis tell Gruber everything about McLean except for his relationship with Holly, but he has probably one of my favorite lines in the entire movie. He's talking to Hans, trying to convince him to take the deal with him, and he goes, Hans, Bubby, and then like goes on with his pitch. He's just an asshole. I don't know the actor's name who played him, but good God, did he sell it. He is played by Hart Bachner. He was in a lot of stuff, but I have not seen any of this but Die Hard. Uh, Children of the Dust, Liberty Stand Still, Rich and Famous. He was on Scandal, but I haven't seen that. I haven't watched it either. But yeah, he killed it. As Ellis, though he had limited screen time, as the next scene after Al and McLean talk a little bit about their kids, McLean tells Al that he has two kids. Al tells him that his wife is pregnant with their first. Gruber interrupts their conversation, telling him that Ellis has given him his name and how he's a New York police officer. And Gruber threatens to kill Ellis if McLean didn't give himself up and give him the detonators. Because that's essentially what McLean has over Gruber at this point. When he killed one of the goons earlier, he took his bag, which is full of C4 plastic explosives and of all the detonators for the bombs. And that essentially gives more motivation to Gruber as to why he needs to take out McLean. He's not just a pain in his ass, he like legitimately is thwarting his plans now. And like we mentioned, their conflicts continue to evolve. Like, this is a really simple story, if you look at it. It's just a guy who's good at his job being a cop, stopping criminals, and he's stuck in a tower with a bunch of criminals trying to kill him. But despite the fact that it's so simple, the conflict is constantly evolving. Gruber's trying to kill McLean because he's trying to thwart his plans. Then McLean has to try and bring the police here. And then McLean steals the detonators to the bombs. And it's just constantly evolving. And it just keeps you on edge. And it's thrilling from start to finish. Anyway, Gruber has Ellis call John to tell him to surrender. John doesn't and basically just goes, Ellis, you moron, they're going to kill you. And Ellis is like, what? No, they aren't. And then he dies because... Of course he does. Yeah. Dumbass. Yeah, it's all the drugs, I'm telling you. Yeah. Stay away from drugs, kids. John McClane keeps moving around the building, hiding. While on the roof, he runs into Hans Gruber, who's up there for some reason. But before that, before that, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I believe the FBI show up, and they essentially take over the entire scene, take over the case... Gruber, in his communication with the deputy, demands that terrorists from all around the world, from like Ireland and Singapore and just terrorists from all over the world, he demands they be released. Though it's also revealed that he does not know these people. He's just pretending to make demands to keep them busy until the FBI shows up, mm -hmm. and which they do and they take over all the scene. And then while Gruber is snooping around up near the roof, he runs into McLean. Gruber immediately is like, oh, wow, gee whiz, I, I am an American and not a British actor pretending to be a German actor pretending to be an American. Uh, I am just wandering around. I'm not evil. And McLean gives him a gun. He's like, whoa, ha, ha, you have given me a gun. Points it at McLean. Gun is empty. They are formally introduced now. And then more thieves show up to rescue Gruber. Big shootout with McLean. Gruber runs away. He's able to get the detonators after they shoot the glass, forcing McLean to run on broken glass on bare feet. Yeah, they just shatter some windows and McLean's feet get cut all up. Because again, throughout this whole movie, no shoes. Yeah, who would have known? She was very important. At this point, Gruber has the detonators. His plan is going to motion. And McLean is wounded. He has broken glass cutting up his feet. As McLean is pulling out the broken glass, he talks to Powell some more. They become better friends. Powell reveals his backstory of how... 
He shot a child holding a plastic gun and was put on desk duty. And that backstory hasn't aged well. Meanwhile, the FBI, there are two FBI agents. They're named Johnson and Johnson. They're both assholes. They caused the opioid crisis. Uh, They decide to cut the building's power, which is exactly what Hans Gruber wants. Because earlier in the movie, it's shown that there are a bunch of locks on this massive safe. Why does Nakatomi have a billion dollars in bearer bonds just sitting in their skyscraper, by the way? Because plot convenience, that's why. Get a bank! But anyway, they have this massive vault. They have an electronic lock, which one of Han's main minions, a hacker named Theo, gets through. Then they have a bunch of mechanical locks, which they drill through. But then there's a big electromagnetic lock. And the FBI cuts the building's power to try and sweat out the terrorists. Exactly what Hans wants. And they open up the vault, and they got all the money inside. Another thing I can't believe we forgot to mention, uh, the first terrorist that is killed off, Tony, is the brother of another terrorist named Carl, who does not react well to his brother being murdered. Well, self-defense. And becomes really, really obsessed with murdering John McClane. And is like the secondary antagonist, this guy named Carl, who's just this big, scary dude. Uh, John McClane realizes, wait a minute, why was Gruber on the roof? (gasps) There must be bombs on the roof, because why would he want the detonators after I destroyed the C4? There must be more C4 on the roof for some reason. I need to get up to the roof. But as he's going up there, McClane is stopped by Carl, and they have a fight. And Carl points a gun to McLean's head and doesn't pull the trigger because he wants to taunt McLean. And McLean disarms him and they fight. And Carl gets hung by some chains, which is brutal. McLean tells Al to apologize to his wife for him if he doesn't make it out. Gruber has his minions take all the hostages up to the roof so that they can be extracted by helicopters. You see, his real plan is to escape through the parking garage after he blows up the roof and everyone thinks that he's dead because everyone on the roof was killed. It's a smart plan. John stops this. He scares off the FBI guys right before the roof explodes. He escapes the roof by, like, tying a fire hose to him and just swinging down in a really cool scene. Yeah, McLean shoots his gun in the air to get them all to go back into the building, at which point the FBI agents are in the helicopter and mistake him for a terrorist and start shooting at him. Well, one thing we did forget to mention was how every once in a while it would cut back to these media personnel who are trying to get the story and they eventually track down McLean's kids being taken care of by their nanny. They force the nanny to interview the kids, which it comes all over the TV, and Gruber finds out that Holly is married to John McLean, so he personally takes her hostage after trying to escape the FBI agents, McLean ties a fire hose around his waist and to try and repel himself into the, one of the lower stories as the roof is blown up by all the C4. Yeah, and it kills the FBI guys, which is fine because they were assholes. Like they say yeah, right as they're flying thing. up that they are planning to kill a quarter of the hostages to get rid of Hans Gruber because so many characters in this movie are assholes. The FBI guys, Ellis, the main LAPD guy, like Al's boss, is just an asshole to him and doesn't trust McLean. The reporter dude is particularly awful. To, like, get an interview with John's kids, he threatens their nanny with deportation, which is so fucking vile. That is one thing that is a bit of a flaw. Not in terms of, like, as it pertains to the FBI agents. That is a bit of a flaw. It's often portrayed in media that local police and the FBI just do not get along and the FBI are very controlling and douchey and all that but from my understanding albeit limited understanding of the FBI and their role in criminal investigating and stuff like that that's often very dramatized just for movies from what I understand the police and FBI work very well together quite frequently when it comes to cases again it's just a unrealistic 
dramatization, but in this film, the FBI agents are particularly vile in that they're laughing as they're saying, yeah, I'm good with losing 20, 25% of the hostages. Yeah, no big deal. That was a bit unrealistic for me, personally. Yeah, I don't know. The FBI has done some scummy things over the years. Oh yeah, absolutely, but I just felt like it was a little bit over the top. Maybe. But anyway, hostages are saved. Carl is hanging by his neck for several minutes. He's definitely dead. Time for the final showdown with Hans Gruber. John McClane confronts him and two of his minions. They've got Holly hostage. McClane is unarmed, seemingly. Actually, he has his pistol taped to his back because John McClane is smart. We get some good villain bouncing off hero. And then, bang, bang, bang. John draws his gun, kills Eddie, punches out another dude. Hans Gruber stumbles backwards, grabs onto Holly, but she lets go of him. And he falls to his death. And the day is saved. None of the... Well, a few of them. Most of the hostages survived and John McClane is alive. Also, one of the terrorists, like, tries to escape through the parking garage and he gets run over by John's limo driver from the beginning. Not just that, he runs into him with the limo and then punches his ass out. Yeah, yeah, take that, nerd. So yeah, after saving the day, killing Hans Gruber, he saved his wife, reconciles with her. He finally meets Al, and the two are friends. They're meeting each other face-to-face for the first time. The deputy, Al's boss, confronts McLean, telling him that he doesn't trust him, he has a lot to answer for. And then the last remaining terrorist jumps up from the rubble, and Al pulls out his gun and kills the terrorist. Carl. Carl the angry man who wants revenge on John McClane and survived a hanging somehow. But yeah, Al kills him. And because Al kills Carl, John McClane is off. The deputy has no questions for him now, surprisingly. <laughs> but uh, the media guy who interviewed the kids confronts McClane and Holly, and Holly punches him in the face on camera, and everybody laughs because he's an asshole and no one gives a fuck about him. Argyle, the limo driver, picks up Holly and John, and the two drive off into the night or into the morning with Christmas music playing, and the day is saved. The end. This film, it's just a dumb action movie. Actually, actually, no, it's not a dumb action movie. It's an exceptional dumb action movie. <laughs> what this film does right, which a lot of movies from the 80s and honestly still today, and honestly, a lot of the Die Hard sequels get wrong, is the main character is such an underdog. Like, he doesn't mow down armies of villains. He kills nine people throughout the film, and each one of them is is difficult. He constantly has to be smart to survive against superior opponents, which is made worse because the opponents are also smart. And this allows for a lot of really creative, interesting action scenes, like him escaping through the elevator shaft or swinging down with the fire hose or taping the gun to his back. Mm -hmm. This film, it's nothing special, but It's nearly perfect in its execution of an action movie. And honestly, I really enjoyed this a lot more than I thought I would. I'm going to have to disagree with you on a little bit. I do think this movie is very special. I think it is a staple of action cinema history. It had an incredibly relatable protagonist, which was out of place at the time. It had a really compelling story with conflicts that were constantly evolving and thrills and intensity that were always evolving and changing and following you from the beginning to end. The directing is phenomenal. The acting is great. The writing is really tight. Small things in the beginning are set up and play huge parts throughout and even in the end. There's a lot of really great humor. Like I said, a lot of really intense action. And I do think that this film is very special. And you're right. I did have a lot of fun watching it. But... I will say there are a few flaws with it. Like I mentioned, I thought the FBI agents were a little cartoonishly vile. 
the media crew that's tracking down them to interview the kids, I, I feel like their presence was just obnoxious. And up until the part where Gruber pieces it together that Holly is McLean's wife, they really don't serve much of a purpose. So watching it is just kind of like, okay, why the hell do you keep cutting back to these people? Uh, when they're interviewing that author of uh, hostage negotiations, it's like, I don't know, I, I feel like that was something you could have taken a little bit less of a focus on because it just kind of didn't really serve much of a purpose and was a bit obnoxious. And from what I heard, those people come back for the sequels for some reason. Well, why? They were, they, I agree, they're the absolute worst part, just that them and also the FBI agents and the LAPD deputy chief are just awful. Like, why bring them back? I don't even know, man. But John McClane is an incredible character. He's very relatable, very well fleshed out, as is Officer Al Powell, who surprisingly, upon... I know I rewatched it a second time today, but when I first saw it over the summer, I was surprised at how much depth they gave him, too. Like, there's a legitimate friendship that they build over this entire situation. And he's a great character, too. And it really took me off guard the first time I saw it. Great writing, great direction, great acting, great characters, a lot of intensity, a lot of funny moments, a few moments where you gotta expend your disbelief, some less than stellar plot points, but overall, I think it's the best Christmas movie ever made. Oh, God. And we almost got through the episode! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wanted to take the last few moments here to talk with you about whether or not it is a Christmas movie, because that is actually a pretty hot debate among cinema fans as to whether or not it is a Christmas movie. It isn't just that it's a hot debate, it's that it's an overdone debate. Everyone <laughs> and their mother has done this. No, it's not a Christmas movie. Even though it takes place on Christmas, it is not about Christmas. There are Christmas movies like Elf or A Christmas Story or A Charlie Brown Christmas or whatever. When you hear them, you're like, oh yeah, that Christmas movie. When you hear Die Hard, you're like, oh yeah, that action movie. Or at least you did until this meme started up. The movie was released in July. It's not a Christmas movie. And this is an overdone bit. Then why in 2019 did Vermont and Kansas vote Die Hard as their state's favorite Christmas movie of all time? Because they're idiots. How can Vermont be wrong, Casey? How can Vermont be wrong? Because they're Vermont. When was the last time you thought about Vermont outside of a discussion of Die Hard Christmas lists? Uh, there was a line in Archer where he's going to Vermont and he's like, Oh shit! Wait, no. They gotta have liquor stores in Vermont. It sucks there. <laughs> Okay. But um, it takes place during Christmas. There's Christmas music all throughout. There's Christmas decorations. They're saying Christmas all the time. I don't know what else to tell you, Casey. I'm trying to make this bit last as long as possible because I'm having the time of my life. Fine, this is my counterpoint. This is... I'm, I'm just throwing it out. This is the ultimate counterpoint. Is Apollo 13 a war movie? It absolutely can be. No. No, don't play devil's advocate. No one has ever seen Apollo 13 and said, oh, that's a really good war movie. But it takes place during the Vietnam War, and that is tangentially related to the plot. Like, it's mentioned Nixon as president, and obviously the space race was because of the Cold War. But when they're flying up to the moon, are they saying, God, this is really going to win the war? No. But throughout the film, they're saying Merry Christmas. They say it sarcastically. Hans Gruber is singing Christmas tunes while on the elevator to torture and kill Takagi. Look, all joking aside, I'm just joking. I really don't care. I don't really care either. It's just a, me it's just a meme. I'm Out of curiosity, what do you think the best Christmas movie is? I don't say Die Hard, like actual Christmas movie. Me personally, I'm gonna go with Elf. <sighs> yeah, I was going to say that. Because Christmas movies are such a subjective, it's really almost 90% nostalgia. And keeping that in mind, for me, it's either Elf or Home Alone. Both because those are good movies, but mostly because I watched them with my family when I was a kid on Christmas. So, they're good memories. 
Yeah. So whether or not you think Die Hard is a Christmas movie, we can all agree. This is a really entertaining, classic action movie with a lot of great things going for it. And there's a reason why it's still considered one of the best action movies to this day. It's extremely entertaining on top of being a really great, well-made film. That skyrocketed Alan Rickman and especially Bruce Willis's career. It's a shame that most of the sequels are mediocre or downright bad. I haven't seen any of the sequels. I've heard the third one, also directed by John McTiernan, is also great. I heard the second one's okay. Fourth one, also okay. Fifth one I heard is garbage. Yeah. And they were, actually, before Disney bought 20th Century Fox, they were planning on making a sixth installment in which uh, John McClane, he's an old man, still a cop, on a case, doing whatever, and it would cut back to flashbacks of him in his early career as a young man, played by a lookalike actor, dealing with his past trauma and his past situations and stuff. So, I don't know. Kind of glad that didn't go through. Yeah. Did you know that there was, and I'm just, I just found out, out about this literally now as I'm looking at the Die Hard Wikipedia page. Did you know that there was a car battery commercial featuring actors of the film that's kind of a pseudo sequel of it about Theo, because he survived the movie, trying to get revenge on John McClane? Yeah, I did. I see it because I've been watching Brooklyn Nine-Nine on uh, Hulu, and they have a bunch of ads with that commercial in particular. And yeah, I did know, and I have seen those commercials. They're pretty entertaining. But speaking of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Jake Peralta, the main character of the series, he's a huge Die Hard fan. It all, com- it all comes and full he's, circle. And he, like, says, Die Hard is what made me want to be a cop. Die Hard's not a good cop movie. It's, well, this is getting into the same thing we just went over. But this isn't about, like, police investigations or anything. It's just about a dude killing a bunch of people in the tower. Really, he doesn't have to be a cop yeah. for the plot to mention. But I feel like we've got off track. Uh, Riley, scores? For all the things that I've mentioned, I feel like I've run down what I've thought of the film thus far. I'm going to give this movie a 9 out of 10. It's really entertaining. A few unbelievable moments, but overall, I think this is an incredibly well-made action film, as well as a great story with really compelling characters and a staple of the action cinema genre. I am also going to give it a 9. It's an action movie really, really well executed. It has really creative, interesting fight scenes. It has a phenomenal villain. It has an underdog protagonist, which so much of the genre fails to do. Yeah, I'm going to give it a 9. Which, by the way, makes this the movie the only time we've given the same scores and also the highest movie we've ever rated on this show. Good. It's a great movie. It is. Go watch it. Riley, where can they find you? You can all find me on YouTube at Riley Thorpe, where you can check out all of my short films and video essays. You can also find me at Riley James Thorpe on Instagram and TikTok. Please give me a follow there. And you can find me on Facebook at Riley Thorpe. You can find me on Twitter at Jarms Casey, J-A-R-M-E-S-C-A-S-E-Y. I've posted some of my short stories there. If you like them, maybe consider buying one of my short story collections because I, I need money. <laughs> Don't we all? College is getting expensive. It is. It really is. Especially uh. COVID since they're not lowering the prices. But that's an argument for another time. We'll be back next week unless we walk over a bunch of glass, which we didn't even really go into that. Oh, God, he walks over glass not wearing anything. Ugh, his poor feet. Yeah. That poor man. Wait, hold on. On the topic of Christmas movies and feet, what do you think is worse? John McClane walking on glass or Marv stepping on the nail in Home Alone? Honestly, I'm going to go with broken glass. Maybe, but in Home Alone, they film the nail puncturing his skin. Next episode, we aren't doing a Christmas movie. I mean, we just did two pseudo Christmas movies, but we're doing just regular movie because it's right before Christmas, and that's when you want to do a normal movie. Also, we record episodes weeks in advance. We're doing all this Christmas talk before Thanksgiving. But anyway, we'll be reviewing a Spider-Man movie. Which one? It's my favorite one. Which one is that? You'll have to watch the episode to find out. (laughs) As always, I'm Casey Jarms. And I'm Riley Thorpe. And hey, it's just a movie. Don't lose your head over it, especially not to a ladder.